Thank you, Madhu. And uh, I'd like to thank Gail and uh, uh, Karen for inviting me to participate today. Uh, you know, but I will admit that this is the first luncheon talk I've given that hasn't had plates in front of everybody. So it's, it's, a, it's a different type of luncheon cost or uh, talk. Uh, secondly, I, I, you know, in listening to the conversations this morning, you know, and as an economist, I, I just ha have a couple things that I'd like to say at the start that doesn't necessarily uh, relate to the, the topic, but I, I want to say them. One is that as an economist, markets work. Markets work. Farmers will plant what they see as profitable. Consumers will consume what they prefer at a price they're willing to pay. So markets work, and there's adjustment in the systems. You know, we've tended to, at least the, with, one, with the exception of, of Chris's talk this morning, you know, I think we forget that we live in a dynamic environment. You know, and where we are now versus where we are a year from now or two years in the future, you know, there's probably going to be some things that we don't know, new technologies, be it CRISPR-related or whatever, but stuff happens, and markets adjust. You know, and that includes farmers, that includes the politics. I mean, we're going to have a change in administration here. Um, the, Canada may want to build a wall. Maybe Mexico, Mexico might want to build a wall. <laughs> but uh, we will have a change in administration, so there's going to be some, some uh, dynamics as we move ahead and, and uh, certainly uh, you know my feeling is that the bioeconomy will be part of that so those are just kind of a couple of intro comments I want to make the second or the third comment I want to do happy new year everyone <laughs> who knows why I'm saying happy new year <laughs> fiscal year that's right <laughs> you know and I, th I think the set or the house yeah, so Happy New Year. <laughs> you know, if we didn't have a budget, my federal colleagues wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, but anyway, as uh, Madhu said, I, I've been working uh, in the Office of Energy Policy at U USDA since 2006. So, uh, ener energy policy and renewable, uh, renewables have been a, a significant part of my, my job with the government for the past several years. And, uh, I think I see the bioeconomy as, as uh, I feel very passionate about it, quite honestly. Um, in 20, 2012, uh, the administration released something called the blueprint for the bioeconomy. You know, um, I don't think that really provided a, a blueprint, but rather a foundation of how important the bioeconomy is, and, and it was rather broad based. So, what I want to do today. couple things. Uh, one is give you some background and perspective from an economic uh, view of, of the bioeconomy. And second, then uh, talk a little bit about opportunities and, and really some challenges. And then I want to focus my, my final comments on some things that, that uh, we are doing uh, in the U.S. government with respect to uh, what we call the Biomass Research and Development Board. I don't know how many folks of you know what that is, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little more. So really, if we look at the global economy, and what I have up here is, is the average gross domestic product uh, for the 2013-2015 period. You know, and those 11 countries that are singled out represent 68% of global economic activity. You know, and if I use the EU28 with United Kingdom still involved, you know, it's, it's even a greater share. And the rest of the world, you know, in terms of the size is, is about a little less than 25 trillion of the 72 or so trillion dollars, you know. So, so when we look at, at, at those countries as well, you'll notice that the good share of those 11 are developed countries, you know, and then you'll see Brazil, China, India as kind of emerging uh, countries, um, and Russia, okay? But when you get down to it, you know, and looking at absolute levels, and I'm going to show this a bit differently in a minute, is that, uh, you know, the U.S. is about 17 trillion over that period, and then by the time we get down to Canada, that's 1.4 trillion. So there's a really dramatic drop-off in the size, and I didn't put populations in here, I just wanted to, to 
illustrate the size of the economies that we're talking about in terms of economic activity. Looking, looking at, at that in a slightly different way, you know, the U.S. represents a little less than 24 percent, about 23 percent of global economic activity. And then China, about 12 percent. And then by the time we get down to Canada, that's uh, about 2 percent, a little less than 2 percent. And the rest of the world represents, as I said uh, earlier, these 11 represent 68 percent. So, and the rest of the world, 32 percent. I'm looking at Toby and doing math in my head. Um, you know, so uh, when we look at research, when we look at investment in the bioeconomy, you know, I think you have to look at where that's happening and then maybe how it's disseminated. Okay. Chris, this is the time. <laughs> okay, uh, you saw this slide earlier this, this morning. Uh, but I have to thank uh, Joachim uh, von Braun because he sent that to me uh, last week. Uh, but Chris was telling me he was really the originator of, of the source of this, the German Bioeconomy Council, Emerging Biofuels and Bioproducts. Can they jumpstart the bioeconomy? Um, the similarity in titles with my jumpstart and, and, and this are, are purely coincidental. But, you know, as, as Chris said, that there's over 50 countries that in some way, shape, or form, either have a dedicated bioeconomy strategy or are developing one. And so when I look at the bioeconomy, that says, hmm, it's a global bioeconomy. And a global bioeconomy is part of the overall economy. So there's going to be something to contribute here. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to kind of say jumpstart is equivalent to opportunities because, oops, oops sorry, uh, and also perseverance because it's not an easy lift to develop the bioeconomy. We heard plenty of discussions this morning. Um, Paul was saying we should invest in, in algae. Uh, our last speaker talked about sorghum and other types of feedstocks. There's lots of research areas that we could invest in, but we don't know which one's the best. You know, at USDA, we have a number of, of uh, research and development projects that go from basic core, you know, feedstock quality, feedstock productivity, to integrating feedstock types in terms of food production, in terms of forestry production. Uh, consideration of social, economic, and envi environmental aspects. I mean, sustainability. It's all, all one integrated system that we're trying to, to meet a demand by producing feedstocks. And again, you know, it's starting with the feedstocks. And again, that's starting with the farmer and what he, he or she is producing or willing to produce. And then we have the entire supply chain to consider for the bioeconomy because we have end users that want jet fuel or transportation fuels, or bio-based products, and heat and power. Okay. okay, going back to some some basics here, and this is a, a just a simple graphic of global uh, uh, fuels, cons liquid fuels consumption, and production, and really beginning in 2016. And this is a, the the projections are from the Energy Information Administration with the Department of Energy. And you know what I really want to point out is that over the you know, this 20, excuse me, right before the 2016 period, there's a bit of a surplus, okay? And after 20, 2016 or thereabouts, that surplus disappears, and then we see some fairly significant upward growth. So that's an opportunity to me for biofuels, liquid fuels. That's an opportunity. The market, the global market's growing, and if biofuels, be it ethanol or jet fuel oil or biobutanol, whatever, if they just maintain a share, there's going to be growth. And again, I think that's a positive for the bioeconomy. Looking, looking in terms of economic growth, and this is in real terms, <coughs> uh, 
you know, over the past five years, the 20, uh, 2011, uh, 2015 period, we had global economic growth of about 2.6%. And a lot of that growth was, was driven more so from the, from the BRICS, the Brazil, the India, the emerging economies as opposed to the developed economies. If we look forward, you know, the next five years, 2016 to 2020, we see a little growth improvement to about the 3% level. Uh, but from a European perspective, it's, it's really kind of mediocre growth, 2%. And even in the U.S., we, we expect to see some acceleration over the next four or five years, but then we slow down to, two, two, to a little over 2%. Overall, you know, those are positive numbers. But we're not going to be expecting. I wouldn't expect the bioeconomy to jumpstart the total economy or the global economy. Maybe in some countries that will happen. You know, if we're looking at feedstock production in a developing country, which is primarily agrarian, and there's some increased demand for those, those products, that's probably a good thing. That's probably a good thing. But in the developed countries, I think it's going to be more of a struggle to see real robust contribution to the general economy from from just the bioeconomy. And I'm looking above and beyond just the basic food production here. You know, and, uh, and it goes without saying that we need to have this, it's, we need to do this in a sustainable way. And I, I, as I said earlier, I didn't, I didn't include population, but you know, we had, I was working with a nine billion, billion people uh, pop population by 2050, or if we go to a 10, 10 and a half billion. The fact remains those people need to eat. We're going to have to provide them protein. We're going to have to provide them nourishment. And we have to figure out how to do that. Okay. All right. This is, this is uh, global oil, or the oil prices for um, the next, until uh, 2040. But I'm going to venture away since I'm mic'd. But here you see where we are right now with low oil prices. And, and that's really a drag on investment in biofuels and, the bi and, and as a consequence it's an investment in moving uh, biomass into conversion for chemicals or other parts of, of bio-based products. And if you look at that, uh, again this is the EIA uh, projections, we're not expected to get back to a, the $100 level per barrel and this is nominal until uh, you know the mid 2020s. You know, the, the 2011, 2013 period when we averaged 100, there was a lot of high, high energy prices. You look for alternatives, you look for substitutes. Markets work, you know, big investment in, in uh, you know, the effort. But uh, as we say, we're in a, uh, a kind of a surplus supply right now. And so prices are weak. And it's, uh, we're really not looking, to, you know, in the longer term, you know, with the, with the liquid fuels markets tightening, in terms of supply equaling demand, we would expect to see some improvement in prices. But again, it's going to be difficult over the next four or five years if energy prices stay low. Okay, and this is not the only headwind that I see. You know, there are a number of issues that need to be overcome. Um, you know, one of those would be technical hurdles. I mean, we heard about oil in stems. I mean, you got to take that from the field demonstration, get a farmer to produce it, get a converter to, to turn it into something else, get the consumer to eventually buy it. So there's a lot of, you know, I, I didn't put my supply chain graphic in here, but there's a lot of steps along the way. And when we tend to get tunnel vision or get myopic in our approach and just looking at, okay, we know how to produce this feedstock, now what do we do? You know, we have some work at, at USDA, uh, we call it the, uh, coordinated by the National Institute for food and, of Food and Agriculture, uh, we call them coordinated agriculture product projects. And these are long-term projects, but they're looking at regional supply curves or regional supply chains. So they're working with producers of the biomass, harvesting, transport, conversion, as well as end users. You know, we've invested 156 million, I think, in seven core projects. I mean, Tom's, you know, leads one uh, at Penn State, uh, but they're all over the country. They're, well, there's seven. They're all over the. 
country, but they're looking at different aspects of the, su of, of su the supply chain, and you know, we're relying on the input from those to learn. How do we move the biomass? How do we produce the biomass? And, how, and, and you know, the nice thing about some of those is that we're working with the aviation industry, and they want the fuel. So there's demand pull there. So another uh, obstacle or headwind is, you know, the infrastructure isn't fully developed yet. You know, we don't, again, go back, markets work, but the infrastructure for the biofuels isn't fully developed. And, uh, you know, I think we, ha we have uh, uh, more, of a, more of an infrastructure developed in, from a chemical perspective or renewable chemicals, but we're still learning and developing and it's tough to set up everything all at once. So it's not like, beam me up, Scotty, I'm here. You know, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. You know, one of the uh, comments we hear all the time, I mean, at USDA we have a, a, a program where we'll provide financial assistance to, for brick and mortar to build biorefineries or, or an integrated biorefinery. But the risk and the access to some of that capital is, is very difficult. So, you know, there needs to be some improvement in maybe even the, the, the instruments, the process, and, you know, perhaps even political support as to how that happens. You know, clearly we'd like to see a lot of private uh, investment, you know, but, but uh, you know, we know that for high-risk uh, investments or high-risk technologies, you know, getting that first, crossing that valley of death, getting that first commercial scale facility is difficult. We know, you know, the nth facility, boy, everybody's going to be in the bandwagon and driving the price down of the product probably, but, but uh, you know, getting those initial investments and uh, the, the significant amounts that's required is, is uh, difficult to overcome. And then there's also, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I thought it was mic'd. Okay. Double mic, okay. Um, you know, and it, then there's also uncertainty. I mean, uh, you know, Brazil's uh, impeaching their president. Uh, we have uh, an election going on in the states where, oh, my buddy Jonathan's eyeing me and said, I, I can't say too much, but we have an election. We're going to have a change in administration, whether it's a Trump or, or, or um, um, Clinton presidency. You know, the bioeconomy is going to continue. It's how their administration decides to support it. And I use support very loosely. Okay. But there's uncertainties. You know, and then the other uncertainty is, is and, and it was alluded to this morning, I mean, obviously we want to continue to be sustainable. You know, and, and sustainability has three pillars. You know, we heard about those, environment, uh, social, and um, you know, the economics. I mean, you've got to make money, otherwise it's not going to happen. But looking forward, how certain are we of the impacts and, and you know, what those markets will, will yield or what the environment will, will uh, how it will be impacted? You know, so we have some of those uncertainties that, that I'm not sure we can, can truly uh, do away with, but looking at ways that we might mitigate some of that risk or some of the concern with those uncertainties. And then, uh, you know, one of the last uh, obstacles, I think, or headwinds is, do we have the right labor force? You know, are people going to be trained to, to meet the jobs that are required, the engineers, certainly the economists, uh, you know, but, but uh, you know, the bioeconomy is an interdisciplinary area. You know, so there's a lot of different types of sciences that uh, scientists that will be be needed, and uh, you know, applying their skills in different ways to the different components of the bioeconomy, I think, is going to be a challenge. You know, that might be an opportunity too for schools to 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 develop programs and training. But anyway, those are some of the headwinds I see. But okay, and then uh, you know what I, what I was jumping here to now is is just some some past studies, and, and I, I've selected three, not because my office sponsored them, but um, you know, just, just to demonstrate that, that uh, you know, we, things haven't really changed in some respects. 
you know, uh, in, in February t 2008, uh, we had a report that was required by Congress, and we commissioned the Informa uh, Economics to do this. And, you know, I, I'm just pulling key points out is that they, at that time, they saw subs uh, the bio-based industry is poised for substantial growth between 2007 and two 2025. I mean, we're, we're only 10 years, we're less than 10 years from 2025 now, and I think we've seen substantial growth. Uh, you know, a number of factors will affect how we develop, you know, cost of inputs, technology available, the, the politics, the administrations, the, uh, and then also replacing fossil fuels lead to a number of environmental benefits, including greenhouse gas reductions, other pollutants. I mean, I think uh, Gail said that this morning from uh, in his his conversation. But uh, you know, we can make different things and you know in different ways and and uh, you know be more efficient about it and and more envi environmentally benign. Another study uh, was. Uh, by Nexent Renewable Chemicals and Materials. This was done in 2014. Uh, at that time, we were, they were looking at the uh, chemical growth, their market potential to grow from like 165,000 metric tons uh, in 2012 to 3.2 million metric tons. So, you know, more than a five-fold growth over that 10-year period, as well as job creation, uh, um, another five-fold growth there. And again, the environmental be benefits from climate to pollutant emissions, uh, replacing coal emissions, replacing uh, you know oil, gasoline, and uh, you know maybe even they, they, they identified some other uh, reduced risk to animals from uh, you know different types of plastics that could be produced or or bi biodegradables uh, as compared to to some of the the products now. And then last. I think it was uh, about two weeks ago, Bio released a, uh, um, Bio is a biotechnology innovation organization. Uh, they released Advancing the, the Bio-Based Economy, Renewable Chemical, Biorefinery, Commercialization, Progress, and Market Opportunities 2016 and beyond. You know, and, and there's really like a five-page summary at the start of that document. And what's, what I found particularly value is they, of value is they included 70 companies and they went through the types of technology and, and production and what they're what they're actually doing in the bio-based sector so uh but you know they they did cite a couple uh statistics from from uh, mckinsey and company uh for uh saying that 252 billion uh or, i'm sorry 252 million uh dollars is a bio-based product sales chemical sales uh uh in in 2012 which was 9% of the global $2.8 billion market. And by 2020, they're looking at that by the renewable uh, by chemicals to, to be somewhere in the valuation area of 375 to $440 dollars, billion, dollars, I'm sorry, which would represent 11% of the, of the global market. Uh, drivers that they were looking at in terms of, of leading to demand, the renewable fuels standard, you know, setting a, a minimum level for, for uh, bio-based or advanced fuels. Uh, also state incentives, Iowa and, and Minnesota, I believe, currently have production tax credits for bio-based products or bio-based chemicals. And so all those things, you know, kind of promote or support the development of, of the bioeconomy. Now looking at the U.S. a little more. Um, Last, in 20, last year, we, we, our, our Bio Preferred program released this, uh, an, economic impact analysis, an economic impact analysis of the U.S. bio-based product industry. Again, this was a report to Congress. At that time, in, in, uh, they estimated in 2013, the size of the bio-based industry was $369 billion in the U.S., 4 million jobs. Uh, and if you look at the actual bio-based production going into, uh, I believe it was the chemical market right at that time, they concluded that, that you could replace three, that, that, that amount was sufficient to replace 300 million gallons of gasoline, which was equivalent to taking 200,000 cars off the road. 
and also uh, the number of products enrolled in our bio-based program. So it's a product that's certified that some share of it is produced from bio, uh, uh, biomass. Was t uh, actually, that number's a little dated now. It's, it's, it's 2,500 products now. So, so we've seen you know, fairly significant growth in the number of products that are produced, as well as you know, we've got a snapshot relative, at least in the U.S., relative to, where, to 2013, you know, where, where we are. So that brings me to uh, some of the work of our, our Biomass Research and Development Board. Now, that board was enacted in 2000, and it is co it's an interagency board. It is co-led by USDA and DOE, and the primary mission or our goal of that uh, board is to coordinate production use of feedstocks and bio-based products. And that's a, a fairly simple goal. Uh, the other, but it is, is interagency, as I said. And, uh, the other agencies involved are the EPA, the Department of Defense, Department of Interior, Office of, Office of Science and Technology Policy, Department of Transportation, and National Science Foundation. Okay, so it's not, you know, it's not the Department of State included, but, you know, it's a pretty broad-based uh, involvement of the U.S. government. And again, USDA and, and uh, DOE co-chair that, that work. And earlier this, uh, let's see, yeah, I guess er it was earlier this year, um, we announced an initiative. Uh, but you know, I think taking a step back, you know, we talked about feedstocks, and DOE has led an effort, uh, the bio, what is currently the Bioenergy Technologies Office, uh, whom you'll hear from Jonathan Mail tomorrow. Uh, but in 2005, 20, 2011, and, and uh, most recently in July of 2016, a report was released that, that's conveniently or, or um, generically called the Billion Ton Study. And what these reports are, are, are um, assessments of the resource availability of biomass from feedstock residues to, to, to crop residues to woody biomass. And these studies were done, again, over, uh, you know, since 2005. The first study was basically an assessment that said, okay, these are the resources out there from a feedstock perspective. Came under criticism that, well, there's no prices, you don't know what it's gonna cost, where it's gonna be. And then 2011, uh, there was some improvement and they started developing some regional supply curves, county, le county level supply curves, looking at prices, added some commentary on uh, the sustainability and added a couple more, uh, expanded the feedstock list. In 2016, uh, again, miscanthus, algae, and uh, switchgrass was added to the feedstock complement that was looked at. Uh, prices were looked at, or, or the cost of delivering the feedstock to the reactor, the biorefinery throat uh, was included. So there's been improvement over time in the study itself, but the basic conclusion is that there is a billion tons of biomass available in the United States. Okay, a billion tons of biomass. The question then becomes, how can we utilize or how can we improve upon the value of that biomass or process it? And that's where our initiative was announced, you know, and looking at, okay, let's utilize that biomass. Let's convert it into fuels, products, heat and power, whatever it happens to be. And, uh, you know, we've looked at, we're looking at different scenarios. But, uh, you know, we're, we're treating this, our approach to the bioeconomy through the, the Biomass Research and Development Board, slightly different than others, is that we're assuming that the food and feed and fiber needs are going to be satisfied. So we're looking at incremental use of the biomass. Okay? We're looking at incremental use above and beyond the food, feed, and fiber. Okay. So, uh, you know, our definition of bioeconomy that, that, that we're using is, is a global industrial transition of sustainably utilizing renewable aquatic and terrestrial biomass resources 
in energy intermediate and final products for economic, environment, social, environmental, social, and national security benefits. That comes from our, our, one of our earlier bio-preferred studies, bio, why bio-based? Uh, and then from a sustainable development perspective, this is you know, what we're considering. You know, su sustainable development is described as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs and aspirations. So again, you know, if we're going to have 10 billion people or 9 billion, you know, we're going to be producing food first and we're going to be doing it sustainably. Uh, so and establishing a path along which development can progress while enhancing the quality of life of people and, so, and s ensuring the viability of natural systems on which that development depends. Okay. So, I said in, in, we announced this vision or this initiative in February of this past year. Uh, we released a report called the Federal Activities Report on the Bioeconomy. And this included one, a, a vision statement saying that, you know, we, we have a billion tons of biomass. You know, what can we do with it? And then a goal of, okay, let's do something with it and, uh, you know, add value. Uh, that Federal Activities Report also included kind of a, a, an inventory of what we consider activities that support the bioeconomy. And again, we, the, the eight agencies that are part of the Biomass Research and Development Board um, identified what they're doing. At USDA, as you can imagine, we had a lot of things because we're all things bio, but uh, you know, we talked about our, our uh, CAP projects, our, our national, our bio, bioenergy challenge area. Uh, we talked about some of the core research going on at the Agricultural Research Service that focuses on productivity, quality of feedstocks. We talked about our biomass research centers that uh, focus on different uh, biomass, um, perennial grasses, woody biomass, oil seeds, including algae, um, sorghum biomass, and, and energy cane. And then EPA talked about their regulatory role with respect to the Renewable Fuels uh, uh, Standards, as well as some of the other regulatory role that, that EPA has. And we certainly, uh, DOE mentioned uh, you know, a number of their uh, funding available opportunities and their, their, their work in uh, conversion and, and uh, market, market deployment and, uh, and things. So the second in a series of, of reports that we're hoping to release, maybe as early as October, uh, the next fiscal year. Uh, the, documents that, the document's actually going through uh, review right now and, and, and clearance process. But uh, what we did as a next step uh, after we released the Federal Activities Report was to uh, hold a number of what we call stakeholder engagement sessions or listening sessions. Uh, we held five of these, uh, over 400 uh, people attended and provided input. And what we developed uh, is, an, is uh, a document that, that we call the Bioeconomy Initiative Revision, Challenges and Opportunities. And these are the challenges and opportunities that were identified by the stakeholders. Okay, so it's kind of the, the customer input, if you will. Once this document is released, and again, we're hoping it'll be released next month, um, our plan is to develop a, a, a strategy or a, an action plan for, the bio e for developing the bioeconomy. And our goal is to have a document or a draft prepared by the end of this, this year. Uh, releasing it with a change in administration pending is impossible. You know, but we, we do hope that, uh, you know, in, in, in positioning this work, it's being done under the auspices of the birdie board, the, the bird board, if you will. You know, we're hoping the administration will like what we've done and elevate it to an administration release. If not, our goal is to release it as a, a biomass research and development board opportunity, but, you know, it's going to be next year. Now, in doing this, we did do uh, some analysis, and, and 
under the, BERT, uh, the, the Biomass Research and Development Board, there is a, an analysis uh, subgroup. And we looked at utilizing biomass in 2030. Okay, and actually the, uh, um, there's an article coming out in, in biofuels, bi bioproducts, and biorefining uh, soon. Soon, the article's been accepted, uh, you know, our revisions have gone back in, so it's just a matter of, of, of the schedule for them. But, but these are our kind of headline items that we've, we identified. And, you know, I will say that the, the way we did this is that we looked at we currently use about what, 350 um, million tons of, of biomass. And we're looking at growing that to a little over a million, a threefold increase. A billion, I'm sorry, a little over a billion tons. And if we allocate it to different markets, this wasn't, you know, it's not a pathway that we looked at.